Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today I'm happy to have joining us my friend Eric Mack, uh, who is a Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Tulane University, uh, a former faculty member at uh, Tulane's uh, Murphy Institute of Political Economy. Um, he's written many, many articles um, and uh, a couple of books. Uh, one on uh, John Locke for Bloomsbury Academic back in 2013, and then most recently one on libertarianism uh, for Polity Press. So, welcome, Eric. Good. Thank you very much. Actually, there's a kind of a mini book, another book on Locke called The Essential John Locke that uh, the Fraser Institute has uh, has just published. Uh, um, but uh, it's a little strange because apparently. Uh, all you can get through Amazon is the Kindle version of it. And if you want the, uh, the real physical version, you have to contact the Fraser Institute. So okay, everybody, write to, the, write to the Fraser Institute for the, the, oh, and you can download it for free from the Fraser Institute site. Okay, I'll make a note of that. I'll have links to all these things in the description. So there's Great. a- Great, good, good. Uh, Calling something so should essential. I start? Oh, calling okay, something the right. essential anything is always sort of asking for trouble because someone's always going to say, well, you left out the most important thing out of your essential thing. You left out the thing that I've devoted my career to. You left out, you know, that's you book we have book four, chapter 37 of, of uh, this particular obscure work. <laughs> that's right. So this is my way of... Uh, uh, implicitly criticizing the entire Locke scholarship uh, uh, domain. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, yeah. Uh, so should I start by talking a little bit about how I got involved with libertarian thought and sure. how it was Ayn sure. Rand as usual? Um, so back in high school a few years ago, um, and, a friend and of mine, where you grew up? Where you know? Where's high school? Oh, I went to a small private high school in Queens, New York, called the Garden School. So you're not Louisianian um, by birth. I'm so shocked. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So you're here. So that I should, the real origins probably is the origin of my accent, uh, uh, which, I'm, which I'm sort of pleased with. My mother was a grade school teacher, and she went back to teaching when I was a year old. And my grandfather came to take care of me every day for the next four or five years. Um, and he had this nice uh, Eastern European, Jewish Eastern European accent. And uh, uh, so he imprinted me with that. Uh, and uh, 45 years of living in Louisiana was not enough to overcome <laughs> that early, that early uh, uh, imprinting. So, well, I've been, uh, in so the, I went to, I've been in the Southeast for 30 years and I don't think I've acquired yeah. a Southern accent yet. No, no, I, I couldn't tell. I can't hear accents, which I think is part of the reason I've never changed uh, my way, way of speaking. So I went to high school in, uh, uh, and actually, interestingly, this was the only sort of uh, correct political judgment, really, I can think of my parents making. Uh, a new public high school was started near where I lived in Queens. And my mother especially thought that it would be totally chaotic and useless, at least during the first several years. Uh, if I went there, and I would have had to go there if I stayed in the public system. So uh, she convinced both my dad and uh, a couple of our neighbors who had sons who were at the same age I was, that we should all go to this little private school, the garden school, uh, uh, which was run by Mr. Flowers. <laughs> Flowers uh, and But uh, yes, it was, it was, it was very, very nice. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember, and I can't, uh, when a friend of mine there um, talked me into reading The Fountainhead. Um, but I can't remember that conversation, but uh, uh, I was very taken with The Fountainhead. And uh, um, in class, in English class, we were reading Boswell's biography of Samuel Johnson, have I got the name? Yeah, I remembered the name correctly. And uh, there were some scenes where Johnson is bullying various other people and uh, making them kowtow to his opinions. 
<laughs> and the teacher said, well, you can see how selfish Johnson was. And all of a sudden I hear myself saying, no, no, he wasn't being selfish. He was driving his sense of self-esteem from what he could do to these other people. And I remember sort of leaning back in my chair and looking at this friend of mine who was at the far end of another aisle. And he goes, yes, you got it. <laughs> so that was my uh, introduction to Rand. And, uh, and that was in New York City. So uh, during high school, I went to a bunch of the, uh, the uh, Ayn Rand Institute lectures and stuff like that. And, um, well, it was the Nathaniel Brandon Institute then, right? Nathaniel Brandon was still, um, uh, he was at pretty much at his peak at that point over that in the next several years. Uh, so, uh, so he was around and um, um, I might as well tell my best Ayn Rand story, which is, sort of fits in at this point. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I've told this to you, Roderick, or not. Uh, um, a few years later, when I was in college, I was at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Um, I think I didn't get into Amherst, by the way, because of the, uh, the Jewish quota. <laughs> they just had too many smart Jewish kids coming from New York. And uh, 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 I knew kids from other areas with less good grades and stuff, but they got into Amherst. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, so anyway, I was at Union College and um, during the summer I was taking a course uh, at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute uh, with um, the uh, maggot uh, Leonard Peikoff, who's been living with Ayn Rand's corpse ever since. Um, and um, he asked a bunch of us who were philosophy majors to meet with him and we'd have philosophical discussions and um, we did have a nice meeting. It was about eight or 10 people um, who were philosophy majors or beginning to do graduate work in philosophy. And uh, uh, it was actually a surprisingly productive and open philosophical discussion. And so uh, at the next meeting of the course that uh, Pickoff was uh, uh, lecturing in, he called us up and he said, I've told Miss Rand about our meeting and she would like to meet with you. So we're all excited. Uh, and uh, we go off to uh, Brandon's apartment uh, a few days later and we get in there and, uh, and Rand is there and Brandon and uh, Barbara Brandon and so on. And uh, um, Brandon pulls out some uh, little uh, note cards that um, one of the people had written some philosophical questions on in preparation for the discussion with Peacock. And he says, we've called you here to tell you that uh, nobody who has read any of Ayn Rand's works or who has any degree of philosophical integrity could possibly ask any of these questions. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes on to berate the, the us for a while. And I don't remember how long it was. You should have spoken to Samuel Johnson. <laughs> Yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, so uh, uh, he berates us for a while and, uh, uh, and then this incredibly remarkable thing happened that all of us except one person in the group, I'll mention him in a minute, uh, so maybe eight or of us, uh, oh, no, he berates us for asking any of these questions and then Rand in this with her beautiful smile says to us, but of course, if you have any questions, <laughs> you know, please ask them. And we sort of look at each other and decide. Prepare to be struck, struck by lightning again. <laughs> we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fall for that. And, uh, and without saying anything at all, um, about eight of us just stood up and walked out, uh, which was great. And the guy who didn't uh, was uh, Harry Binswanger, who was still involved with those people. And he went over to apologize. And, uh, he sort of knelt <laughs> down and submitted <laughs> and so on. So that was my, that's my best uh, yeah. Ayn Rand story. I have heard that so anyway, before, but that's actually one I was hoping that you would tell. Um, yeah, good, good. It was, it was, and, and um, the friend who I mentioned who got me interested in Ayn Rand uh, was also in that group. And I saw him a bit for a couple of years and then I didn't see him for 30 years uh, or have any contact with him. And when I sort of reacquainted with him, um, his memory was exactly the same as mine. So that was, that was 
good because this is the sort of thing you could puff up, you know, otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, because of Rand, I was, I be, you know, decided to do philosophy. Uh, and, uh, um, and probably uh, thought I what to do epistemology and metaphysics because the view was that that's what you should do ultimately. Uh, um, and so when I went to graduate school at the University of Rochester, uh, and I actually worked a lot with uh, the great, really great Kant scholar, uh, Louis Beck. Um, One of my colleagues was a student of his also. Say again? One of my colleagues was a student of his also and has told was me why. Also, who was that? Kelly Jolly. Oh, okay, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah so he yeah. was he was he, terrific. He, he likes to imitate Beck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, go Beck was. Uh, and um, um, and Beck had this um, exaggerated sense of my abilities uh, for some reason. Uh, um, he, um, um, I wrote a paper on Kant for him in my first semester in graduate school, and uh, and he thought this, you know, he, I got an A on it. And he thought it was really great, and uh, um, uh, and. Uh, called me into his office and he said, you know, Mr. Mack, this is a terrific paper. You know, I think, uh, you know, we definitely should try to get this published. And uh, there's only uh, one objection, which I'm sure you're aware of uh, <laughs> to the argument you make. And uh, so here's the objection, right? And, uh, but I'm sure you can think of a response and work it into the paper and do that. And we'll send, we'll send it off to Kant Studio. I had no idea what he was talking about with the objection. It was just completely beyond me. <laughs> so I said, yes, professor, I'll, I'll come back to, with you when I've worked this out, and, uh, uh, but never did. But, but I was going to write a dissertation on uh, synthetic a priori propositions, truths. Um, and, um, and I told Beck that I want to do that. And he said, well, that's terrific, Mr. Mack. Uh, I think you should acquaint yourself with the secondary literature to begin with. <laughs> 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 this was this was a, this is still the days of, of mimeograph sheets, right? So he handed me probably about a twenty page uh, a stapled together batch of mimeograph sheets, maybe twenty or twenty five articles. Is that the pale on each that's right. That's right. And yeah, uh, I hated that oh, stuff. Maybe, maybe sixty percent of the articles were in German and thirty percent in French, maybe ten percent in English. And he said, uh, you know, just sort of read through these things and acquaint yourself. So uh, um, then I had lunch with Richard Taylor, who was also at, uh, at Rochester at that time. And uh, somehow in conversation with him, I said, you know, somebody could write an interesting dissertation on natural rights. And he said, uh, why don't you? Uh, and I went, wow. <laughs> and so then I had to go to Beck and uh, sort of explain that somehow I decided really to do natural rights rather than <laughs> synthetic a priori propositions. And, uh, and, but he was my second reader and he turned out to be a much more important advisor. Even at Who was your time. first reader? So, so, so Taylor was my first reader. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, and I wrote, I wrote the whole dissertation and put it in his uh, little mailbox. And two days later, it was in my mailbox with a little note from him in which he said, I think this is very good, but I think you should have more subtitles. That was his entire feedback. <laughs> and then I, then I worked with nope. Beck a lot. So I think Beck, Beck, in ways that I can't specifically remember, uh, must have, um, must be somewhat responsible for the sort of Kantian tone of my work in political philosophy. Um, so I think uh, probably more than most libertarian theorists and maybe at least as much as Nozick, uh, uh, there's this sort of uh, Kantian coloration to my, to my position. And I'm sure that Beck played some role in that. Although again, I can't remember exactly. I don't remember a moment where, uh, where uh, something clicked that he had said. Uh, but anyway, so I wrote this dissertation on, uh, on natural rights, which was uh, 
finish before Anarchy State and Utopia was published. Uh, so I'm sort of pleased about that. Um, and then parts of it have been got, got published fairly early on. Uh, in uh, uh, The Personalist, which was this journal that John Hospers took over when he- Yeah, I, to, I remember it. Um, yeah, yeah. So for a while- Did it, there did were it a change of, its name to something else? It's now the Pacific something quarterly or yeah that sounds the word I remember, specific is in the time i remember yeah. you know looking up various articles probably yours among them back in yeah yeah back in the day when i been, was you know, hunting down various leads yeah this would have been the very early 70s i think uh so uh, a few years ago i was at um one i would of, have hunted um, down in the early 80s yeah i was at uh, one of uh david Kelly's Objectivist Institute, Institute of Objectivist Studies, summer things. Yeah, it was some it, it, nice. Changing the name to you know. Yeah. Because uh, it's 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 an institute that's in the Federal Witness Protection Program, I'm guessing. But yeah, it's, <laughs> that's good. It, but I think it started off as the Institute for Objectivist Studies, and then yeah. it's been the Atlas oh. Society and the Objectivist yes. Center, and I think it's the Atlas yes. Society now. Is yes. The, yeah. Is, Stable yeah. equilibrium. So, it on. so at this, actually, it was at the first one of these I went to that this friend of mine from high school somehow saw an announcement of it, and he came there, and that's how we 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 acquainted ourselves. But uh, some very nice young man came over to me and said, uh, "Oh, you know, I've read your 1971 paper on how to derive ethical legalism from in the personalist and." Uh, and I said, oh, you know, that was a paper my dad wrote. <laughs> but I thought that was funny. Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, so uh, um, yeah, I went to Rochester originally because I thought I was going to do metaphysics and epistemology. Uh, there was a course even on the nature of universals, right? And I, as a good Randy, and I thought I, had to take that course. It was, turned out to be a terrible course, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was saved by that uh, that lunch conversation uh, with Richard Taylor in terms of doctoral dissertation. Yeah. An anecdote that uh, that Kelly tells about Lewis White Beck is uh, they were taking a course on uh, you know on Kant and the under section of Kant that's labeled the typic of practical reason, and uh -huh. Beck says. Well, can anyone tell me what a typic is? <laughs> and there's just dead silence in the room. Yeah. And he says, yeah. there are dictionaries, boys and girls. <laughs> Again, dead silence. He says, well, if you had bothered to consult the dictionary, you would have discovered that the word typic is not in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard a story actually from Robert Paul Wolf about, uh, um, oh my gosh, I've forgotten his name. This extremely famous Greek and medieval, oh, Harry Wolfson, uh, who is at, taught at Harvard for many years. And, uh, and he also had this sort of Eastern European Jewish accent. And uh, he was teaching an Aristotle seminar. And uh, he starts the seminar by saying, uh, uh, the crucial thing I want to get across to you, at least at this meeting, is that according to Aristotle, matter was edible. <laughs> and the students look and say, it's, it's, it's crucially important that you grasp uh, that the edible, that, that matter is edible, according to Aristotle. And the students are sort of looking, looking, and one student raises her hand and says, uh, well, Professor, I'm, I'm sure it's very, very important, but I just don't understand why the fact that you can eat material is the crucial thing about Aristotle. And Wolfson says, edible, edible, two plus two is four, edible. <laughs> uh, so let's see, after grad, I've spent four years at Rochester, uh, and then um, I, um, I got my first job 
teaching at a horrible place called Eisenhower College, which doesn't exist any longer in Seneca Falls. And uh, I had, uh, I got that job. It was a long, complicated story. I won't tell the whole story, but basically I got that job because George Walsh, who was associated with Ayn Rand, mm -hmm. uh, uh, had made a huge mistake and quit his job at Hobart in William Smith College, which was a real place, and took over the job as the head of philosophy at uh, Eisenhower College. And I had met, I had met uh, George at uh, one of these um, listen to tapes, listen to lectures about objectivism on tape that was taking place in Russia. So he wanted to hire me and, uh, uh, and I went there. I guess I should mention that it was around that time that I uh, first became aware of the, uh, um, the libertarian arguments for anarchism. And I was at that time uh, an anarchist, uh, which upset George a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm even wondering, you were probably at Cornell, not yet at Cornell. This would have been like 67, 68. I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it's close. I, okay, so anyway, because I was I born in 1964. Dealings. Really? Yeah. Really? Okay, okay. Well, yes, you were. I was not a then, Your philosophical development was especially remarkable. <laughs> uh, because I, at that time, I had some dealings with, the, uh, with some sort of objectivist student group at Cornell, and uh, for some reason, Oh, Rod must have been around there, even though he hadn't gotten long pants yet. But um, anyway, uh, um, yeah, so um, uh, I taught at this place for four years. Um, I, um, I did a very smart thing because uh, I, did, I knew I did not want to spend my life at this horrible little place. Uh, but I knew that there was this thing called adaptive preferences, right? And I would get used to it and decide it wasn't so bad and so on. So when I went there, I decided I have to immediately begin to do things which will at least eventually get me fired. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did many, many things which were perceived perhaps as somewhat obnoxious, like the, uh, the academic vice president of the place spoke with a sort of froggy voice. And uh, um, so I called him Froggy, right? And I publicly would address him as, as Froggy, which is probably cruel now that I think about it, but. Uh, so you can was, recognize accents when they're froggy. In the uh, I did, did do the, yeah, I, did, I, got, I got the frogginess. And, uh, and ultimately this culminated in uh, a sort of hilarious uh, uh, episode in which, um, um, I tried to get the fellow who is the chairman of the Tenure and Promotion Committee um, removed from the Tenure and Promotion Committee because uh, I had, uh, in the company of several other people, heard him uh, uh, express the view that, uh, that Adolf Hitler was a great man and it was only too bad that he wasn't allowed to finish his work. Um, and uh, um, this fellow was apparently determined to help finish his work by ensuring that every Jewish candidate who came up for uh, tenure was rejected. <laughs> and, was his admiration uh, for Hitler, was there any cognitive dissonance with that and being at a college named after Eisenhower? Uh, I gather it was kind of on the other side. Didn't, didn't ask. The fellow was, a, he was a Sikh, a very, very large Sikh guy who had been a police captain in India and had come somehow ended up as a professor of English uh, at this college. Uh, so he was called the gorilla. Uh, uh, and, gorilla uh, or gorilla? <laughs> ah, uh, G O R, uh, so on. Uh, um, so um, yeah, I tried to get him uh, removed, but the the other person who was party to the uh, conversation in which he said all these nice things about Hitler was a, f a friend of his who was also the Dean of Humanities at the college. And uh, when I said, you know, 
Dr. Murdoch heard the same things I heard, right? You know, why don't you ask him? Dr. Murdoch said, uh, you know, by that time in the evening, I'm always too drunk to remember what people say. And that was the <laughs> Very end. convenient. So, short, shortly after that, I was fired. <laughs> so uh, that's, that was my, uh, my checkered uh, early uh, history. Uh, well, I mean, so, that's, that's not a bad reason for being fired. <laughs> no, 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 it worked out fine. That actually, what was, what was interesting was that I, it was, this was all according to my plan. And yet I still felt angry. Yeah, you couldn't have counted on having the pro Hitler guy there. That was just uh, No, no, that helped out. Soldier. That helped out. <laughs> and in the meantime, because of the anarchism business, uh, uh, I think George Walsh I don't know, but I think he was not as uh, I think he may be he Maybe he thought he could have done something to protect me, but he didn't do as much as he perhaps ought to have done to protect me because he was a little pissed off about the anarchism <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So shortly after that, I, I actually pretty much stopped being an anarchist. I know this is a horrible thing to say, uh, um, but uh, I'll mention the, the philosophical argument that uh, that. Um, led to my, probably the beginning of my giving up the anarchist position. My wife and I were watching, uh, the, I think was it was it Frank Church, the senator from Idaho, who had these hearings about abolishing the CIA. And we were watching this on TV. And uh, um, my wife said, um, you know, now that I think about it, I'm against abolishing the CIA. And I was disturbed and puzzled by this. I said, well, why would you be against abolishing the CIA? And she said, uh, if we abolish the CIA, we won't know where those people are. <laughs> I thought that was, <laughs> so you can see the projection right onto, uh, you know, you wanna know precisely who the people are who are using force and then maybe you have more chance of controlling them is I guess the argument there. So anyway, I did the last, after, after, the last bit that is, you know, is the real trick. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. No doubt about it. Uh, then I, uh, um, I didn't get a, went back in the job market, didn't get a job for the, uh, for the next academic year, but discovered there was a pretty easy way to sort of worm your way into what was called a liberal arts postdoc fellowship at, at Harvard. So I did that in 74 to 75. And that was right after Anarchy State and Utopia came out. And um, um, I, I took a, 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 I sat in on a seminar that Michael Walzer did. I was going to do a seminar with Judy Sklar, but didn't. Um, I sat in one of Nozick seminars on philosophical explanations. Um, but mostly uh, about every two weeks, I would go and spend the afternoon talking to Nozick about political philosophy. Uh, and that was terrific. Uh, and then I went back on the job market. And I think partly because one by then I had, so I had then really, really nice letter from Beck who really liked me. Uh, and a really, really nice letter I'm presuming from Nozick. And uh, uh, my wife was teaching at the University of Massachusetts at that time, became friendly with the lady who at that time was Robert Paul Wolf's wife. We got to know Bart Wolf's quite well. I actually gave the libertarian lectures in uh, Wolf's undergraduate political philosophy classes at University of Massachusetts. So I had a letter from him too. <laughs> so that was not a bad portfolio. Yeah. yeah, that was good. That worked out well. And sort of I got, uh, uh, that's where I, that's when I ended up com coming down to Tulane, uh, where I stayed for over 45 years, I guess. Yeah. And Tulane was pretty good because my department was mostly sane people. Uh, and then I had you were teaching at Tulane and your wife was teaching at uh, uh, LSU. LSU, that's right. That, um, 
just for your you for our viewers who might not know who she who Mary Searidge is, you want to say anything about her and what she Yes. Was yes. She's so Mary Searidge is her name. And oh, is it? she actually started out more in aesthetics than in medieval philosophy. Uh and uh uh wrote a dissertation that was sort of philosophy of language, philosophy, uh, aesthetics about the nature of fictional language. And I think it was called truth, truth and meaning in fictional language or something like that. Uh, but more and more drifted over into uh, uh, doing medieval philosophy. And she does um, the sort of stuff, what I really love about what she does, which I don't understand at all, is it's the sort of stuff that can only be done in a, an incredibly wealthy society <laughs> where people are able to, some people are able to spend their time in these just incredibly esoteric fields. So she does uh, medieval philosophy of language and philosophy of logic. And uh, a lot of it is, is involves uh, uh, producing um, 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 scholarly editions. Um, out of um, fragments of manuscripts that have described, uh, that have survived from the 13th century. So, so yeah. Uh, so I had the very good fortune that uh, Mary can read my papers when I'm writing them and help me by making suggestions, but, uh, but I can't, <laughs> I can't reciprocate because I don't know. And Mary, occasionally, now that I've gotten a little more interested in people who wrote in Latin, <clears throat> occasionally, I'll bring the the Latin text, which I can't read, and I have some reading of the English text. And we've got Van Kloof Lock that wrote some of his early stuff in Latin. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and stuff uh, on the law of nature, which is probably that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I think I think the early tracks on government were probably yeah uh, in Latin as well. So so yeah. So I so she can help me out, and I. And I'm just incapable of reciprocating, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so that's what she does. Where should we go from here? I'd like the uh, um, philosophical views. Oh, uh, sure. We, uh, sure. Sure. You're your uh, Randian, Lockean synthesis or yeah, yeah, Jambalaya. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I was a I was about to say when I was a kid, but this was through a period of time that I, let me go back a minute. I think my, um, my real break probably with objectivism um, uh, was not so much that episode I told you about, right? Because after that, I, I still would get the objectivist literature and read it and stuff. But actually, it was probably uh, um, um, on the anarchism issue. Um, and what struck me about, because when, when Rand had this little like one or two page attack on, on anarchism, you must remember this. Uh, uh, um, I knew enough carpet. about what the, yeah, well, it was more like, I think, just like a, a little Oh, what, are those, what are those squibs in the objectivist or the objectivist newsletter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at this point, I knew enough about what the anarchist arguments were that uh, I could see that she was, you know, profoundly denouncing something which she didn't have the least bit of understanding of, right? And so that was, that I think was, was an interesting moment. Um, I used to in just just uh, interject briefly there. I just finished re reviewing um, Foundations of a Free Society, uh, for um, which is a an Ayn Rand Society uh, publication anthology. And uh, huh. there's a piece in there by you know your old comrade in arms Harry Binswanger, um, where he's uh, he's arguing with uh, an anarchist and he says. Well, you know, I've been you know, I've been debating anarchists for the first for, for the last fifty years, and this is the first time I've ever heard this argument that if it's all right for the government to use retaliatory force, then it must be all right for individuals to use it too. Uh, 
Really? He's never come across that argument before yeah. in 50 yeah. years of debating, and he is contributing an essay yeah. on this topic. Yeah. yeah. And he also yeah. mentions yeah, some of the, and he's replying to also someone who's citing David Friedman's book. He says, Well, I never read David Friedman, but I remember having a conversation with him, you know, a few decades ago, and here were my reactions. And this, this is just an odd way of doing <laughs> this yeah. is an odd way of doing yeah. traditional philosophy. Yeah. 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 My last conversation with him was uh, uh, probably the, uh, within six months or so of the, uh, the Brandon Rand break. And uh, I actually, I was with this high school friend of mine who I've mentioned a couple of times who probably knew Binswanger, knew Binswanger better than I did. Uh, and we were in uh, Binswanger's uh, East 60s townhouse. Binswanger's family had a lot of money. And, you know, when he was like 20 years old, he owned this beautiful, like on 61st Street, East 61st Street townhouse. Oh, that wasn't and, too far from Rand's apartment, right? Uh, no, she was in the Empire State. She was, no, no, she was on, on, uh, her, her apartment she was, like was like on, on 34th 66th, Street. I think. I mean, her, I think her apartment was on 66th, wasn't it? I think it was much further downtown. And I, I was about to make a mistake because I was thinking of the Empire State Building. With well, see, they had offices there for there. a while, but uh, yeah. I, their apartment was on East 66th. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. My, my only knowledge would be where Brandon's apartment was, but now I'm uncertain that I remember where his, his was. But anyway, so I, I was, we were at, in, in, at Binswanger's townhouse. My, my, my high school friend and myself in Biswanger, and he said something like, well, where do you stand on between Brandon and Rand? And, uh, and I said, uh, well, uh, I really don't know what actually was going on, but uh, the statement that Brandon had sent out seemed to me a lot more coherent than, uh, than what Rand had to say. And I could see like the, the shutters come down. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you are clearly one of the evil ones. Uh, uh, so I'll tell one more story later on about uh, that, the Rand world. Uh, um, but um, uh, I always thought when I was, uh, um, when I thought of myself as something like an objectivist, that, um, um, that there were these two propositions uh, that uh, objectivists maintained. One is that, um, People ought to seek their own greatest good or fulfillment or well-being, whatever. And then there were all those problems, right, in Rand about whether that was just longevity or, right, all that stuff. Uh, but there was that proposition, and there was a proposition about respecting other people's rights. And I always thought that uh, it was not or not just for the sake of your own well-being that you should respect other people's rights, but that other people had a claim on you <laughs> that their rights be respected. Uh, so that uh, in some sense, uh, talking about other people's rights as reasons for how you should act was giving what I later learned could be called an an other regarding reason, right? It was, there was something about the other person in virtue of which you should be constrained, not just something about what was in your self-interest. Um, and, uh, um, and in a way, that's where a lot of my philosophical writing has started, which is uh, to ex try to explain what it is about other people that give me a reason to be constrained in my behavior towards them. And if the reason is said to be, well, it's advantageous to me to be constrained, then I haven't yet come up with the right type of reason. Uh, the right type of reason has to be something that proceeds from some fact about the other person, uh, not from some fact about myself, to put it probably too crudely. Uh, and so, and so, uh, and the reason to be constrained is not because 
it advances the good of other people um, because then the good of other people becomes part of your ultimate end and that's incompatible with your own good being your only ultimate end. So it has to be a different type of reason uh, and, and which I think of as a deontic reason. And so uh, 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 this is where a type of what I sometimes call a type of dualistic view uh, I adopt, right? Namely that there are different types of reasons. Uh, there are value-based reasons and the core value-based reason is uh, the rationality, the pursuit of your own well-being, uh, properly understood and all that stuff. Uh, and then the core of this other type of reason is the reason, is the fact that other people are beings with, who have ends of their own. And that fact becomes a reason for your being constrained in how you treat other people. It's the fact that they're beings of that sort, not the value for them of being beings of that sort. Right? So that's what a really, really basic thing that I've tried to work out. Um, when I, and I was separated from, had nothing to do with uh, these various objectivist movements for a long time. <clears throat> and then I got involved for a while <clears throat> with the Kelly people. Um, and one of the things that struck me during that involvement was that they were as committed as the official Orthodox Randians to the view that ultimately the reason for, there could be no, there could be no reason for being constrained in your behavior towards other people except a self-regarding reason, right? Uh, and, you know, maybe it took the form of, well, I, I won't try to say more about that, except that it, it seemed to be impossible to get across the idea that there might be a consideration on behalf of being constrained in how you treat other people, which didn't resolve itself into a self-interested consideration. Uh, and so I was, that's, and that seems to me to be deeply wrong. Uh, and so I was more right than I realized in thinking that, uh, that what I take to be the Randian position on this, uh, is thoroughly, completely held by, by across the board, by Randian type people. And so a criticism which might have seemed to me to be unfair when I was back, back in the day, that it's that the objectivism, the objectivism is close to solipsistic. <laughs> uh, um, seems to me less unfair than I thought it was. I mean, there is something, uh, there is, you know, that, that every consideration has to ultimately resolve itself into um, considerations of one's own genuine long-term well-being. Uh, and that, uh, which means that ultimately, there's nothing that one owes other people, <laughs> right? All proper behavior is something that you owe to yourself, right? Uh, and that, the more I think about it, the more I think that that's, that's a mistake. So part of my view is always, and I've always sort of thought that there is this sort of tension in, uh, in human life, right? Between the person's perfectly reasonable, good pursuits to their ends, and uh, the fact that there are ways of pursuing those ends that um, or unacceptable, right? Or unacceptable except under the most extreme circumstances. And so there is this tension in human life. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, the objectivism seems to refuse to recognize that there's that possible tension, right? Which maybe ultimately can be resolved, but it's complicated, much more complicated. By the way, a quick aside, I just looked up, and of course you're right, 
for three main apartments who are on East 34th, 35th, and 36th. And ah, if, I had, huh. if, I had, if I had pictured uh, Manhattan geography to myself, instead of just thinking of the numbers that felt familiar, I would have yeah. realized that you know, uh, 66 was way too far uh, afield. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my memory was simply that it was near it was near the Empire State Building. Uh, was my was my yeah. memory. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, so uh, the um, you know, so uh, you know, the other way of um, of trying to uh, uh, deal with this problem, sort of a more Aristotelian and less Kantian way, is to treat uh, other people's interests and concern for them as part of your own interests rather than as a strategic means to them. Um, right. So that, right. you know, that gives the Randians more of what they say they want, but right. there's still a lot of resistance because they've got this, this focus on survival as yep. the, you know, as the basic uh, driver of uh, normativity. Right. Right. And of course, right. other people's interests are not constitutive parts of your survival. Um, right. Now, now I've seen some interesting, some fancy footwork. Um, in fact, in the in this the volume I mentioned, Foundations of a Free Society, mm -hmm. Greg Salmieri yeah. gives this argument, actually specifically replying to something I'd said in an earlier piece. He says, "Well, uh, you know, is um, you know, is photosynthesis a you know uh, a strategic means to a plant's survival, or is it part of it? Well, it's both because it's." Um, uh, you know, is photosynthesis is a you know is a means to plant surviving. But what is the yeah. plant surviving? It's engaging in these various activities, and photosynthesis is one of them. Right. Well, fine, that works for photosynthesis, but it doesn't work for rights respecting because you can survive just fine without respecting rights. You know, not just fine in a you know in, a, in an elevated sense, but just fine in the sense that you right. are you are still alive right. and conscious. Right. Um, right. So. Uh, you know, so although I prefer the more Aristotelian to the more Kantian one, although my my Aristotelianism is you know is, is more Kantian inflected than than some versions yeah. are. Um, yeah. But still, the uh, you know the the main problem with the, sort of the mainstream Randian view does seem to be this this strategic view, which doesn't is isn't really obvious in in the novels as much. I mean, I have a hard, I mean, when, I mean, Rand has this passage where she talks about uh, why, you know, why you should be honest and why you shouldn't tell lies and sort of the stuff about right. how it's, you have, you have to keep track of too many lies and yeah. it's too hard to fake reality about keeping track of all these different lies. And, you know, am I supposed to believe that that's why Howard Rourke and Dagny Taggart don't cheat their customers right. because right. They don't have the right. processing capacity to keep track of all their lies because they do right. actually, you know. Right. They, you know, they're right. smart enough that they could be successful. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at look at Francisco Danconia, who who does engage in massive, you know, deception and fraud, but he does right. it, you know, in, in in a virtuous way for virtuous motives right. against evil oppressors. Uh, right. So it's not as though, you know, it's somehow impossible to do. Um, but I think that when Rand, uh, my theory is when Rand tried to start building the philosophical foundations for the ethical outlook she had in her books, uh, you know, she had, um, you know, she had sort of too restricted a set of tools. And so she started looking, looking at these very strategic uh, accounts of, of, uh, of well-being and very strategic accounts of Morality. I mean, in a way, it reminds me of John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill, you know, for him, mm -hmm. it's sort of universalist rather than individualist consequentialism. Right. But in both cases, right. you know, Mill has this, sort of this very rich uh, theory that combines aspects of classical Greek conception of human nature and romantic self-realization and classical liberal rights and so forth. And then he wants to cram it all into this consequentialist yep. Uh, yep. framework, and it creaks and it groans and he's it's he's putting all this good stuff into this musty right. old bottle that right. he inherited from his father <laughs> right right the example that i have used a couple of times and I'm, i haven't used it for a while and i don't remember actually the the details but in the fountainhead when rock blows up the low-income housing thing portland 
in Portland housing. Well, yeah, there's there's a line or two, and I can't remember how it goes, but where he assures himself that the watchman is not there, uh, and therefore won't be, and won't be killed. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, does that sound? Does that? Yes. Fit your memory. Uh, uh, and again. Uh, uh, so what's the motivation for that, right? Uh, you'd think the motivation would be, my God, this, I, this is other human being with a life of his own, right? And it's, it's not acceptable for me to take that life, right? Even if it's sort of incidental to what I'm currently planning on doing, it's not, uh, it's not somehow my life will be worse if I take that life. Uh, well, you might say it's worse because then I'll believe I've done something wrong, but you need the independent explanation for why it's wrong. And that always struck me. And so there is, so we build into Rock's motivational set, as they say, right? Things that the, uh, the moral theory as such can't explain. So I, yeah. So I'm more, um, uh, as you can imagine, I don't think the, um, the, um, the fleshing out well-being in an appropriate Aristotelian way is gonna enough get you <laughs> to, uh, the sort of raw fact that other people count, right? And uh, you studied with uh, Lewis Beck. I studied with Terry Irwin. So, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is right. This is exactly right. So, I mean, like, the Dugs, right? Also have, in a way, in in a somewhat different way, but adopted this the uh, philosophical strategy that you mentioned. Well. Uh, but yes, then, no. I was going to say, but they, then they've got they this metanormative they, framework stuff, which that's right. Well, that's what I was going to say. They which, need they, know, they, they, they see they that they need, yeah, they see that they need that also, yeah. right? That seems like uh, it's a, you know again that seems like a consequentialist thing. It's, it's, right. It seems like it's the benefits of living in a society that yeah respect yeah. right. Yeah. The benefits of living in a, you know, the strategic benefits of living in a society that respects right, right that can't be the reason right. why, you know, I right. shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't right. murder my neighbor in secret and take his stuff. That's right. That's uh, right. No, I agree. I agree. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. Uh, okay. I mean, so there's Plato, all that. Plato that, got made the basic point in the second book of the Republic uh, is that, you know, whatever your account of, of, uh, of justice is going to be, it can't be, well, you do it because all of these, you know, you'll right. you'll secure, you know, cooperative responses from other people. Right, um, right, right. There's the right. ring of Gyges right. blows that to hell. Right, right, right. And then there's this, all these interesting passages in, in Hayek where he uh, he says, uh, "Well, you'll secure cooperation if you abide by the if if there's sufficiently general compliance with these norms." But you won't have sufficiently general compliance with the norms unless people think that the norms themselves demand respect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a sort of transcendental argument up to the norms. Uh, uh, I've actually written some stuff about this that I've not yet published. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it seems like, I mean, it doesn't seem like Hayek mm -hmm. thinks that there really is a, a reason for those norms. It's just that Yes. It's just that, you yes. know, everything would be better if we, if we think there is. It's kind of... That's, that's and, right. And I, I often said he seems to be doing, trying to do the rule utilitarianism what rule utilitarians do to act utilitarianism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. like a meta rule utilitarianism. Yeah. There's still the same puzzle. If you recognize that the only reason for it is ultimately yeah. this, this act, yes. and then it's yes. not clear why you're, why you're motivated to still yes. abide by the rules in cases yeah. where you can... Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I agree with that. And in Hayek, there, are, there's, he takes the same stand on uh, believing that people are responsible, right? The reason we should believe that people are responsible is that it works out better for us if we believe that, not because it's true. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, uh, 
So this is, and this is also part of his Vienna 1930s <laughs> uh, upbringing. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, let's see. Uh, so a lot of the work I have done is not just on those really deep in questions, but on, uh, uh, some, I say somewhere, and I think this is true, um, I, um, if I've had a sort of program from my philosophical, most of my philosophical writing, it's to try to identify the hardest problems for libertarian political philosophy and come up with solutions <laughs> to those problems. Uh, so um, um, I think uh, one of the early versions of that is to come up with uh, a much better version of a sort of Lockean proviso than you see in either Locke or in Nozick. Um, I think another, I, I've also, I think, sort of devoted, a, this is a, sort of an aside, maybe more time to detailed criticism of people who aren't, well, the people like Hillel, I, so I've, that type of left libertarianism, the Hillel Steiner type, I think maybe I'm the most extensive critic of I was going to say within libertarian writers, I think actually non-libertarians haven't done much in the way of, of, of critiquing that type of view. Uh, and I think I've probably written the most uh, uh, in sort of criticism of G.A. Cohn, especially G.A. Cohn's criticisms of libertarianism. Um, uh, but I, but also I think the other the other work that I'm probably most pleased with, and there are a couple of essays involved, but it's um, breaking from the idea that lots of libertarians have either held or they've been thought to hold. And that's the view that there is one fundamental natural right, which is a right natural right of self ownership. And I've sort of argued that there's a sort of an array of natural rights, um, that there's something deeper, there's something more fundamental, which is why in one essay called the Ur claim <laughs> that uh, uh, one is to be allowed to, one has a right to be allowed to pursue one's own chosen ends in one's own chosen way. Not a right, I'm sorry, you have a claim to pursue your own chosen goals in your own chosen ways there are different ways in which that claim can be violated and like interfering with your bodily movements or destroying your personal faculties uh, and the right of self-ownership is the proper articulation of this more basic Ur claim so as to achieve moral protection, to express moral protection against that way of preventing people from living as they choose. Uh, there's a right against deceptive manipulation because deceptive manipulation is another way of preventing people from living as they choose. Uh, uh, and there's a right of property, which is essentially the right to make things your own and exercise discretionary control over what you've made your own. And we have that right because preventing people from making things their own or preventing people from exercising discretionary control over what they've made their own is another way of preventing people from uh, pursuing their chosen ends in their own chosen way. So I try to give this account of why there's, uh, uh, in a certain sense, the most, the, high, the most abstract thing is this Burr claim. Uh, less abstract are the, are the specification of the rights, which are plausible ways of articulating the Burr claim. And then even less abstract, more concrete than that, is uh, 
the conventions that we have <laughs> for what counts as a violation of these abstractly stated rights. Uh, and so, and the idea is that uh, um, in, there are lots of different sets of conventions, which if we had them, we would have concretizations of these basic rights. Uh, there's no philosophical argument for why if you started from a blank slate, you should choose one of these sets of conventions rather than the others. Uh, like, you know, there's, but, a, there's a reason to drive on one side of the road rather than the other, but it doesn't have to be the right side as opposed to that's the right. Side. I think that's what that's the right. is called reducing the law of nature. There's a, general principles of the law of nature that are independent of convention, but then yeah. convention determines which particular instantiation of That's those right. one that we'll go with. That's right. That's right. And if we have, in fact, conventions that instantiate in that way, uh, since we have to have <laughs> conventions that instantiate so that people can actually know how they're supposed to behave and what they can expect of others, uh, then uh, the obligation to abide by the abstract right takes the form of the obligation to abide by the existing and functioning convention. So um, that's something else that I, I'm sort of pleased to be writing about. And this obviously is a response to uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Murphy and Nagel. Uh, who hold that since everything is, uh, everything is, since, since the real work is done by conventions, there's no point in uh, trying to refer back to, to abstract rights or the relationship between those rights and, uh, and the convention. So I tried to write against that as well. Do you have any uh, thoughts of collecting some of these essays into, uh, a, oh, and then there's, into a book? Because you? it might be more accessible than just so scattered across various journals. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, oh, and by the way, uh, in case there's anybody out there who's a, a publisher looking for a brilliant collection of essays, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been actually, I've put together about 14 of my essays and I've written, and they're like, they're grouped into four sections in, a, in an anthology and I've written this wonderful set of reflections on these essays. Um, but um, apparently publishers have become very reluctant to publish what they call single author collections. Uh, and so far I have not been very successful at finding a, that means I've been totally unsuccessful <laughs> at finding a, a publisher for these essays, but uh, I'm still, I'm still, well, we've got one buyer once it <laughs> once it comes out. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I apparently the idea is by publishers that because you can so readily get uh, through JSTOR or something, uh, particular already published essays. Uh, uh, well, if you're you know if you have if you're in, if you're at an institution and it happens to have subscription right. to the right, you know the right. Uh, domain within JSTOR and so forth. I mean, uh, right. you know, lots of people right. who are sort of, you know, um, you know, educated, interested people who don't have that kind of institutional access. Right, right. That's just right. more convenient to have it all in one, in one place. Yep, yep, yep. 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 This, is the, <laughs> this is the argument I've been making to, uh, to publishers so far, uh, plus the brilliant reflections uh, on all of this that ties it all together in a terrific way. Another issue I think is, uh, is actually the, uh, uh, the sort of anarchist versus minarchist position. And uh, um, I, probably when I was an anarchist, maybe even after I was an anarchist, I, uh, have always argued that the uh, the sorts of arguments against well, what the, the the greatest example right of a super sophisticated argument against the uh, libertarian anarchist position right is the first 
part of Nozick's book. <laughs> uh, and I've always argued that that fails. Uh, um, but um, uh, what I've really written about is not, what I've really written about is what should our philosophical stance be if it turns out to be true that uh, collective action problems are going to be, will always be severe, or will likely always be severe uh, for the funding of uh, public rights protecting public goods, right? Uh, so, uh, a good functioning police force, if this, if that's possible, <laughs> uh, you know, national defense or, uh, type things, right? Uh, uh, and so I've not, I, my view is that I'm not, I, I am unable myself to know. I can't evaluate, uh, uh, you know, the sort of complex game theoretical arguments that, uh, that people make for uh, um, either the possibility or the like, I don't want to put, that make for the view that there's a significant chance that the standard collective action problems could be overcome. Uh, I can't evaluate those arguments and I can't evaluate the arguments that say that it's very likely they can't be overcome. So as a philosopher, I try to deal with uh, what could be said philosophically if, um, if it turns out that or if we assume that the collective action problems can't be overcome, uh, and therefore we assume that uh, um, rights protecting institutions themselves wouldn't be uh, sufficiently funded unless people are required to make contributions. Um, uh, so again, that's a, uh, type of hypothetical question. Um, and there I argue that uh, um, if it turns out that uh, um, if you have a situation, <laughs> so to have a right, let's say to certain financial resources is to have a right that it not be taken from you without your consent, right? And without your consent is crucial. Um, so if consent is not feasible for various reasons, namely, you know, free riders, strategies, strategizing in various ways, uh, so that even though it would be advantageous to you to consent, you don't consent because of those sorts of complicated considerations, uh, then it might be true that um, those funds can be taken from you as long as you're duly compensated. So, you know, in the language of law type people, uh, the uh, right that you have to those funds, um, although ordinarily a property right which says they can't be taken, uh, is demoted <laughs> to a liability right, uh, which allows them to be taken as long as you do the compensate, and the compensation would be the protection that you get. So, um, and that this is a type of flipping of, of Nozick's view, which is that rights start out as just the liability rule rights. And then under certain circumstances, they should be treated as property rights, as, as rights that are protected by property rules. So my hypothesis is that no rights start out as rule, as rules protect, as claims protected by property rights, but there are special circumstances under which 
the only it's a, it's appropriate to treat them only as claims that are protected by liability rules. So that's one thing that I'm sort of thinking about, and it may be the same thing is that what allows one which allows one to uh, engage in what was sometimes called soft paternalism, right? To grab the person before the person steps in front of the bus. Uh, ordinarily, you can't grab people without their consent, but uh, it's not feasible to require consent in, you know, because there's not, in this case, just not time, right? Uh, and so uh, what just, what makes it okay, permissible to grab the person is, uh, that under those circumstances, their right is not a right not to be touched, but a right to be duly compensated for being touched. And the due compensation is saving their lives. So if, if they really wanted to kill themselves, it turns out you would have failed to compensate them and you would be guilty of a rights violation. So, so that's- Do you compensate that, them by that, paying them or do you compensate them by killing them? <laughs> Right. Uh, I think that, so their claim that their rights have been violated because they haven't been able to be killed would uh, be tested by proposing that you kill them and see how they respond. If they go, swell, <laughs> then you know that you have to compensate them in that way for their rights violation. <laughs> you have to kill them? Yes. Well, yes, I guess. I mean, and, and of course, we're Im imagining they they not they now obviously there are the big problem a big big problem is people's minds change in the course of the the story right uh, if they if they continue to desperately want to die I guess uh, you're I mean, obligated. if you're thinking of a case of someone who's unable to kill themselves someone who's like paralyzed from right. neck down or something uh, right. I'm just thinking of this person who you know who steps in front of the bus and you pull right. them back. Uh, right. And then, the, and then you say, all right, well, so I guess you wanted to step in front of the bus. All right, well, then yeah. you know, we'll step in front of the next bus. And they say, no, you're the one who pulled me back from the bus. So you have to shove me in front of the next bus. I could step in front of it. I'm perfectly capable yes. of doing it. Yes. But you, yeah. you know, I, I demand yeah. you push me. Um, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. I don't feel as though you're obligated to. to push. I, I think you're right about that because. Uh, 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 you can't afford um, them. You might just be having enough to push them. <laughs> um, the if they say, and it's true, that they need an Uber ride back to the bus where the bus is run, and they have no money for the Uber ride, you have to pay, give them the money for the Uber ride. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but what you, what, what you owe them is something like the least costly <laughs> uh, um, way of, of enabling them to do what you've prevented them from doing, right? Uh, and maybe uh, uh, in the case that you described, the least costly is, oh no, you're free to step in front of the bus. Uh, not... Uh, you Actually, they'd be violating the rights of the bus drivers. So we would have to change the example. But say it again, they, they violate might be the rights violating of the... the rights of the bus driver by right? you know interfering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Details, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. I mean, so yeah, we've been assuming that the bus is just sort of on automatic, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, um, just like you're jumping off a building, and you know you're usually, ca you're usually causing littering and and possible endangerment. Yes, yes. So, but you know, yes, jumping yes. off a cliff in an unknown area, yes. or jumping off yes, jumping off a yes. building that you own and sure. with an unoccupied sidewalk that you right. own, or something like that. And right. That's right. That's right. So, in fact, so if you bring in all those considerations, you have an argument for a non-paternalistic argument for stopping the person from stepping in front of the bus. Namely, he's about to damage the bus. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so, uh, uh, but don't tell anybody about this argument that we've just developed because it'll then be used to control people's lives even more thoroughly, right? Uh, All right, so to anyone listening to this video, 
plug your ears during this part. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I was just thinking about the, uh, the helmets if you ride a motorcycle. Sure. So there the argument is um, um, <clears throat> your, the, the helmet laws are protecting other people from bearing the cost of your medical care. Right. So once you do that, right, just about anything can be prohibited on harm to others, other grounds. That would be. That would. Be. Although you know, if you're Bill Gates, you, then you could, you could drive without a helmet. Ride, you could ride without a helmet because. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. You have to put up a bond before you drive without a helmet. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, there was a proposal at a, a certain point. Uh, when people were worried about the imposition of costs by, for instance, hikers who get lost, right? And then the medical, the rescue people come out. That uh, one proposal was that uh, you have to get a license to be allowed to go hiking. <laughs> uh, but, and, and maybe somehow the total fees of the license would come. But another was that you would have to post a bond. Uh, um, which would cover the costs of your rescue, and then if you didn't, so all of these things, right, are uh, are uh, dangerously totalitarian. <laughs> so again, yeah, cover up your ears on that. Yeah, yeah. So let's see, uh, what else should I talk about? I remember saying some time back that there was another story, but I'm not sure I remember the context. Uh, I could tell Nozick stories. Oh, sure. I'm happy to hear a Nozick yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the best Nozick story I can't tell you because it'll come across as uh, kind of making fun of somebody that doesn't deserve fun to be made of. It'll come across that way. So, so I just, uh, so maybe I'll just tell the story. When I would work, when I would go to Nozick's office, um, uh, to talk to him about political philosophy, um, I would say at least half of the time I would be there, you know, and I'd be there for maybe two or two and a half hours in some afternoon, uh, he would get a phone call and I'd just hear his side of the phone call, but it was clear he was getting a phone call from some new junior faculty member at Harvard who was a young hotshot in, and now fill in like a dozen different fields, you know, physics, mathematics, game theory, economics, psychology, um, uh, sociology. Uh, and Nozick's side of the conversation would be, uh, oh yes, you know, the chairman of your department mentioned that, you know, you that he had suggested to you to call me. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I would be delighted for you to come to my office and for us to discuss your work. <laughs> and, uh, and I actually, part of the story I'm not telling is uh, reason to believe that, uh, that very often the, um, the sort of initial paper that one of these young hotshots would publish uh, in, of course, any of these fields uh, um, would be a paper which uh, um, before it was submitted by that person, he had gone to talk to Nozick about. And Nozick had, had helped him write the paper. And uh, in one case, I, and I'm, the story I'm not telling, it was clear to me afterwards that uh, that uh, a paper that uh, um, was brought up in a conversation uh, on, in astrophysics uh, was uh, one of these papers where someone brought out for other reasons, right, to make a point. And then Nozick said, oh, you know, yeah, I know about that paper. In fact, uh, uh, the problem in your discussion of that paper is that you miss the significance of footnote 32. Uh, that this was one of these papers that one of these young hotshots at Harvard had gone to Nozick, right? To, so he was, it was just apparently common practice at Harvard for 
any young person in any one of these fields uh, to be uh, for the chairman of that person's department was to set up uh, an arrangement for this young person to go talk to Nozick about that field. Interesting. That's the yeah, because you know, that's the the kind of sort of you know, universal savant that we you know think uh, died out, so if not with yeah. the Renaissance, then at least yeah. By yeah. the end of the century. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm remembering now that uh, one time I was talking to him about what my wife did, and he said uh, something like, uh, I'd really like to talk to her sometime about medieval notions of infinity. <laughs> so well, that could go on forever. That, that, convers that gave us a conversation that, as far as I know, that conversation did not take place. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, one could talk about optimism versus pessimism in the world we're now in, but that would be <laughs> too much of a downer, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, I talked a little bit a while back about uh, this notion of uh, that under certain circumstances, um, rights take the form of uh, claims to compensation if the right is intruded upon. Um, and I think that idea is probably applicable in some strange, rough way to things that have gone on in the world recently, namely uh, uh, sort of on behalf of some segment of the population. Um, well, no, let me back up. Probably what's true, right, is that all the people who have been locked out of work, right, and locked out of the right to move, just straightforwardly have had their rights violated, right, because the... Uh, the sort of joint danger of them continuing to work uh, has been exaggerated, right? Uh, the, the, you know, the total negative effects of people continuing to move around and getting infected uh, hasn't in any way justified uh, the sort of systematic lockdowns, but yeah, completely incompetent to assess. What, yeah, no, no. So again, and this is a case where, you know, what philosophers can do is just talk about. Yeah. If it's this, then some, it's this, yeah, right, right. So one possible, the other possibility is that uh, there is a sufficient prospect of jointly. <laughs> produced ill effects on other people that un very unusual constraints uh, are permissible um, on certain segments of the population, basically people who have certain types of jobs, um, but that uh, those people have to be compensated by the people who are being protected by those constraints. And that uh, horribly might justify people who are being protected being taxed to make the circumstances of people who are suffering from the lockdowns less severe. And so it's a it might be a case of uh, a bunch of people saying, we don't have to bear the risk that will emerge if you people keep wandering around and doing crazy things like going to your jobs uh, or moving around. Uh, it's too much of a risk for us to bear. Uh, so we're going to impose these lockdowns, but our justification that can't be described as you're about to violate our rights. Uh, so the appropriate 
course is the middle course. We don't tolerate you doing that, but we compensate you for not tolerating it. Uh, so, uh, well, it seems to me that case, I should come out uh, well either way then, because since I can work yeah. from home, um, yes, you know, the lockdown doesn't apply to me, but also I don't have to be out out with other people either, and so they're not endangering me. So uh, I shouldn't be locked down, but I also shouldn't be taxed. That's that's my view. <laughs> shouldn't, yeah. Uh, because I'm not one of the ones that they would be uh, yes. endangering. Yes. Since yes. I rarely yes. emerge from right. Hospital, right. Right. So I suggest. Right. So if you if you can, without much trouble, uh, uh, adjust your behavior, or maybe you don't have to adjust it at all. Right. So that you're not in danger, not in the danger that would be generated for other people, right? Then you're not one of the people in whose name the lockdown is being done. And then you, the, the, the argument that I sketch for why you should have to require, why you should have to contribute to the compensation to those people would not go through. Yeah, I agree. My university is very eager to have us all come back in person in the yeah. fall, but they, yeah. They fell short of actually requiring it. Um, they, right. they they used Weasley language for a while, but then finally backed back down, saying, "Oh no, we're not requiring it so long as you can, you know, you know so long as you can provide the uh, you know, the relevant educational like, right. experience, yeah. as long as it's agreed between you and your chair. So it, it doesn't require higher administrative approval. As long as you can agree right. with you and your chair right. that it, that it's right. adequate." Right. Uh, so that's right. Uh, yeah, that's that's yeah. my impression of other schools as well. Uh, friends of mine who initially thought <clears throat> they were being pressured in some ways to actually meet their students face to face. Have, well, I know some to, places where they really are requiring them to yeah. come. Yeah. Um, yeah. In person, though, that may you know that might if they do that, they may suddenly if there's a spike, they may suddenly you know have to switch gears. Right. Right, right, semester. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, and I've spent too much time sort of reading stuff that I really am not competent to understand about, uh, you know, risk levels, all this sort of stuff. Uh, well, right now, you're in, Indiana, you're in uh, Colorado, right? I'm in Colorado, and which is uh, in this nice little town, which apparently, despite there being something like 60 or 70 percent of the normal tourist level to the town, which I'm surprised at. Uh, and that's been going on for a couple of months now. There's still no spike. Um, well, and it's, it's a little uh, easier to do physical distancing, you know, out in the... Yes. Know, yeah. Yeah. And that's what people are doing. Yeah. For me, uh, the negative thing is that there are more people out on the trails. And you do have this little dance that you do when you cross people on the trail. Somebody has to kind of, should step off a ways. And, you know, I, I pull out a little mask I have in my pocket and put it on my face more as a signal to other people, right? This is one of those occasions where we have to, and uh, uh, it's a good kind of test of uh, how, I don't know, sort of morally alert other people are. And um, um, some days it seems to me I'm feeling good about mankind because most of the people seem to be morally alert. And other days uh, I'm impressed with either how just stupid people are <laughs> or, uh, or maybe, you know, they, they're just not willing to accommodate in these sorts of situations. Uh, uh, so here in Auburn, when I see, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, when I take a foray to campus, I see a lot of people wearing masks. But just driving through town, seeing yeah. people waiting at the you know, the outside cafes and so forth, yeah, hardly anyone's yeah. wearing masks and all crammed. Uh, yeah, they seem, yeah, they seem yeah. And you know whether that's correlated with any any uh, change in infection rate or anything like that? Um, 
I think it's, it's probably too early to say because we're just we're just yeah. getting we just finished up the summer semester and just beginning the fall semester, which will be you know, yeah. Those are the so students have just started coming in, um, yeah. in uh, large numbers, and the yeah, uh, the town sort of transforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you? I mean, there, there's this. You know, there's been the people I the the um, sites I go to, right? Uh, which are probably mostly where the current crisis is being discussed. Most of the people are economists, libertarian inclined economists, uh, uh, and nobody is. O almost everybody seems to say there's a sort of crisis. There's risk, or we don't know what the level of risk is, uh, and the risk, unfortunately, is, doesn't come from particular individuals, but from uh, the agglomeration of the things that different people are doing. And so at least some significant level of coercion, which is normally impermissible, is permissible under the circumstances. That's the general tone of, uh, of these uh, sites that are very, you know, or probably everybody writing on that site is thinks of themselves as a libertarian, but but mostly economists who think of this. So, do you think do you think that that's a horrible response? Not not necessarily. Um, yeah, I have a piece I've written called "On Making Small Contributions to Evil" about yes. uh, you know uh, you know when you about people who are doing things that aren't individually. Uh, uh, harmful, but can be harmful uh, uh, collectively. And I argue for a couple of different claims to sort of go in different directions. One is that um, you know, I argue that you're often justified in making small contributions to evil because it's just so hard not to. Um, right. Uh, but that you know you have an obligation to sort of you know sort of a um, a Kantian imperfect obligation to you know to pick someone's not to do. Um, right. but you can't pick all of them. Um, but also in cases where the evil you're contributing to is a rights violation, um, then even though what you're personally doing may not be, uh, you know, morally forbidden, it can be possible, uh, for, um, uh, you know, for people to exercise some kind of self-defense, uh, and right. We just exercise self-defense against a collective. The only way you can exercise self-defense against a collective is by laws that impinge on the uh, on the individuals. Now, it's something that shouldn't you know shouldn't right. be done you know lightly or, or too easily. But yeah, I think in principle it can, it can be justified. Right, right. So if we have we have somebody a a, a full-fledged typhoid Mary, right, who's going to infect anybody she comes in contact with justifiable to restrict her movements. If we have 10 people, each of whom is one tenth of, each of whom there's a one, there's a probability of right point one, right? Yes. Uh, then somehow maybe the way to put it is we can, we can restrict, we can engage in about one tenth as much restriction, right? I mean, we'd have to. It might be more than that, right? It might be. Yeah, I mean, originally came up with this argument in thinking about global warming, which again I have. Sure. You know, sure. I don't feel competent to 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 judge to assess the actual scientific claims one way or the other, but just thinking about you know, assuming that um, assume that it's anthropogenic, assuming it is uh, right. serious. Um, you know, so I remember seeing a, a talk by George Reisman, uh, where he said, uh, you, people can only be, uh, you can only retaliate against individual responsible actions. You can't, you know, you can't, um, you cannot defend yourself against the collective. Um, and so if it turns out that the collective activity is actually going to cause all this, uh, yeah. all this disaster, there's nothing you can do, uh, legitimately. Right. And that seemed, uh, 
uh, wrong to me. Interestingly, wrong to Walter Block too. Uh, I usually yeah. think that someone who will yeah. gravitate to some position I won't agree with. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, he also said, "No, I think that uh, you know you can you, know, you can defend yourself against a, a, you know, a collectivity through some kind of uh, yeah. force of legal means." Yeah. Yeah, and actually, this now fits into what I was talking about before about uh, 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 intrusions for which there's compensation. Right? You may uh, the alternative may not be you lock up those ten ten percent typhoid Marys. Each of them you lock up one tenth of the time. <laughs> right? It might be that you restrict all the time you restrict the movements of those people, but you compensate them in various ways. Right? So you have to stay in your house, but we'll pay for your cable TV and your internet. We'll send f nice food over to you every now and again. Uh, um, so it's, you multiply the amount of coercion that you do, the amount of coercion that you engage in across those 10 people is more than it would be for the one typhoid Mary, but you, you're you compensating them. So maybe that's the way to handle those cases. Uh, oh, so that's interesting. Uh, um, um, yeah. Um, um, it's, uh, it's, um, I don't know now whether to think that um, uh, the world that existed eight months ago is going to come back uh, in fairly short order once we have vaccines and so on, or whether um, um, the last gasp of uh, a fairly free society <laughs> has, has already taken place. Uh, I saw a meme online of someone uh eagerly watching the um uh you know on uh december 31st 2020 they're usually e eagerly watching the clock count down for the year to end 11 58 11 59 and then to their horror it says 11 60 11 61 december 31st 2020 there's, ah, there's no way out <laughs> yeah 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 it's been quite a year and of course not just the you know, the uh, the pandemic, but all kinds of wild stuff has been happening this year. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in history books, unless unless twenty twenty one is like even crazier. Uh, yeah. But if it isn't in history books, they'll be they'll be you know they'll, people will write whole books just about the year twenty twenty. Right. Like right. now, it'll be the books about the, 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 say. Sixty eight. You said. Did you yeah. say sixty eight? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sixty-eight. I found much more entertaining than the <laughs> twenty twenty. Uh, you yeah. could go out in it. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what do you? What is your view about um, the vitality of sort of libertarian thought within academic philosophy? these days. Uh, I don't know. I'm always struck by um, how many graduate students are being supported by places like IHS and then how few of them I ever hear about five or ten years later. Do you have that sort of experience? I'm, I'm not as much in the loop as I uh, yeah. as I used to be. Um, yeah. But I certainly know, um, uh, you know a lot of the people who are, you know, I know a lot of people who are you know, coming up through George Mason. Um, yeah. So uh, a lot of economists, not philosophers, but a lot of them are very, you know, philosophically minded. And I also, I know some, you know, some young libertarian philosophers who seem to be having uh, promising careers, but, uh, yeah. you know, I used to be more on the, um, you know, Used to be more on the uh, you know, the think tank circuit with everyone from 
you know, from uh, IHS to the Mises Institute, and I'm not really, uh, right. I'm sort of, I'm persona non grata at the Mises Institute these days, and then uh, IHS, I think, I, IHS retrenched its, uh, a lot of its um, lecture programs, so I don't have as much contact with the yeah. rising uh, generation yeah. between academics as I used to, so I don't really know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is this a good time to sign off? I think, yeah, the, actually, partly just because the, there are limits to the processing power of my uh, my internet hookup. And so, um, you know, round uh, between an hour and a half and, and two hours is like the right. uh, the limit if I uh, want to upload these things. It takes uh, forever. So this is probably a, yeah. is a good time to sign okay. off. Well, uh, good. Uh, good. Let's do. It. I enjoyed this a lot, Roger. Thanks for thanks for asking me. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. I mean, we could try to do it again sometime. I'm sure we can find something else to uh, good. talk about. Good. Um, good. Do you have plans for? Do you have other people lined up? Um, well, I just interviewed uh, you know, Nira Badwar and I saw that one. I saw. Uh, I saw that it existed. And Kevin Carson. The Kevin Carson one hasn't hasn't loaded up yet, but it. Um, uh, it it uh, it'll go up a little bit before uh, yours, and I've, I've been lining up other people, but I haven't. Uh, but you're, you're you're the third person I've actually uh, interviewed. But there there's several other people who have, who have promised okay. to. Well, I hope that uh, the vaccine arrives, uh, and we'll all be back well. to getting together around nice dining room tables. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the, one of the things I. Uh, I definitely miss traveling to interesting uh, places. I, you know, I, I'm curious to know whether, you know, whether, you know, uh, you know, I'm scheduled for both the Eastern and the Pacific APA. I have the gravest doubts oh, wow. of APA happening. Wow. Even the Pacific yeah. APA, I, I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. California is going to be locked down for five years, I heard. Ooh, that should be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Pacific APA is in is in uh portland uh oh oh, oh okay that nothing ever happens in the little town of portland <laughs> no that's right that's right yeah wow wow i just got um um noticed that and i was sure this was going to happen that a liberty fund thing that was scheduled for november is is canceled uh so. yeah well, and i have a friend who has a wedding sort of thing um, well, they're already married, but they're having sort of a more public celebration of their of their wedding. And right. it was supposed to be in the spring, and then when they moved it to December, and they thought, well, surely by December, they live in California, th surely by December. Uh, yeah. But uh, um, you know, I have my doubts about that coming off. Uh, yeah. Uh, either who knows when I will. Yeah. When that'll happen, though, I certainly hope to get out yeah. there when it does. Yeah. 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 It'll all come back. Most of it will come back. It'll be good. Uh, a couple back, yeah. of years. A couple of years of celebration. Uh, <laughs> thing, I hope. Yeah. Good. Should I sign off? Yep. All right. So thanks a lot. And yeah. uh, thank you, Roger. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. Let's see. Bye bye. Leave. I hit.